What's good, everybody? I'm Yendrek. He's Sodek. And today we are gonna discuss the metagame trends in Modern in April 2022. Let's go. Alrighty, so a lot of things uh, has happened uh, since our last metagame update because the last time uh, we've recorded one of those, it was still before the Ludus ban. So, yep. We are basically in a brand new world of modern these days. Uh, is it that new? Well, I, I think it is... Okay, maybe not brand new, but definitely uh, different than it was. <laughs> yeah, that's true. much different than it was. Uh, something, some, some things stay the same. Um, like some rules of engagement, for example, you still need to t kill turn one Ragavan or you'll be in trouble or you still have to risk a pack like Cascade uh, and other decks, but a lot of things has changed. The decks that are now on the top of the format weren't really there uh, a month or month and a half ago. Um, yeah. Um, we want to s say anything else before we dive into it or? Like my, my first impression after this thing, month is that modern mm, didn't get that much with the Lurus ban like everyone ex expected then that once the Lurus is gone there that there will be a lot of new decks that will mm, try to be beefing uh, but suddenly it wasn't the case here and like most of the time during the tournaments we see the same decks that were around even with the Lurus Mm, and other decks that were too weak to compete with the Luru, in the Lurus world are probably stick to, still, you know, not good enough to constantly top eight after top eight major tournaments. So they are, you know, waiting for for their uh, moments to shine. With a few exceptions, but we'll probably uh, say that once we we get to to these decks. Yep. Okay. Uh, so we're gonna cut to our usual segment with, if you're watching this video for the first time, we highly recommend you uh, to check out this part when we will talk about, or my recorded voice from a few months ago, we'll talk about uh, how we define different tiers and um, what it takes for a deck to reach the, the, the highest grade that we, uh, that we can give a deck. Okay, so after that, we're gonna be back to talk about an actual tier list. So don't go anywhere and we'll see you in a bit. Okay, so we've already went over our tier system in our first video, but thanks to Sodex's brilliant idea, we've decided to record this part as a separate segment that we'll just put in every tier list update. So it will be more convenient for those of you who are watching us for the first time to learn how we understand different letter grades given out to various decks. If you've already watched this segment in one of our previous videos, feel free to skip it because it was literally copied and pasted in the post-production and it's identical to its predecessor in our previous videos. Our biggest problem with the tier system was lack of meaning behind different tiers itself. Without a proper context, you can argue with your friend whether a certain deck is tier 1 or tier 2, only to find out that you both might mean the same f f thing by saying tier 1 or tier 2, but your understanding of what tier 1 or tier 2 mean were different. Because of that, it was vital for us to create a unified system as to avoid any misunderstandings. There are many qualities by which you can describe a deck, but we've decided to stick to two different axes, raw power and positioning. What do we mean by raw power? For example, a deck that presents a fast, stable combo kill backed up by multiple layers of interaction is a deck with high raw power. Living End comes to mind as such deck, thanks to being a one-card combo with a lot of cantrips and free interaction. Other archetypes that high on the spectrum can be Merktite Regent. Consistent to color mana base, a smattering of highest quality threats and answers and great sideboard options speak for themselves. How about a deck with low power, low row power level then? Well, 
it's harder to find those decks in a format as powerful as modern. And previously we did have Mill as an example of a, a low raw power level deck. But I think that's actually Burn that suits that description the best. It is doing the same rather unimpressive thing every game. Its cards are not great individually, just look at Shard Volley or Skullcrack. And the strategy is easy to hate out, but it can be a contextually strong choice in the right metagame. Hence our use of two axes to better describe the overall strength of any given deck. To distinguish between decks that are lower and higher on the raw power spectrum, we are using terms bad decks and good decks, respectively. Notice that both of those adjectives are in quotation mark, and they are not the only factor when it comes to the overall quality of the archetype in question. A low raw power level deck can be good or even great choice on a weekend, and those words are just making it easier for us to communicate with you and each other. Second axis is positioning, and here the description is much more straightforward. Decks that are low on this metric are poorly positioned, and decks that are high are well positioned. When it comes to tiers, we've decided to split our tier list into four different tiers. S, A, B, and C. S tier is fairly obvious. It's just best deck, or decks at the moment. Sometimes it will be one deck, sometimes multiple, and other times there won't be any S tier decks. As far as A, B, and C tiers go, those rough guidelines will help you understand what we mean by those tiers. Most of the time, A tier decks are both high in raw power and well positioned. B tier decks are good on one of those axes, but low on the other one. So for example, if Living End, a deck that I've already deemed as a really strong deck in terms of raw power is poorly positioned, it will end up being in B tier most of the time. Conversely, if the metagame is favorable for Baron, a low power level deck, it will also end up in the B tier. And sometimes, if it's extremely well positioned. It can even end up in the A tier. Keep in mind that those cases of low powered decks in A tier will be few and far between and won't happen more than a couple weekends per year for any given archetype. And then the C tier decks are, in our opinion, irredeemable under certain conditions that are true in the format at any given point. To sum it all up, we've prepared this handy dandy TLDR for you. So, to recap. S tier decks are best deck or best decks in the format. A tier decks are either well positioned good decks or very well positioned bad decks. B tier decks are either poorly positioned good decks or well positioned bad decks. And finally, C tier are poorly positioned bad decks. Know that those guidelines are not always true and sometimes a high row power level deck, such as Living End, might end up in a C tier if it's really poorly positioned, according to us. Or that not every deck in B tier is either high on row power and low on positioning and the other way around. Sometimes there will be a deck that's mediocre on both of those axes and it will end up being in a B tier anyways. Thanks for watching this explanatory segment and let's jump right back into the video. Okay, so uh, for this episode, we've decided to go in a bit different order. Instead of going alphabetically through all those decks, we're going to go still alphabetically, but inside of tiers. So we are start with S, S tier decks, then A tier, then B tier, and then finally C tier. And then if a deck is in like different tiers for both of us, it will, will go like for on the order from the highest tier. So for example, if there is a deck in A tier, we will in, in Sodek, but B tier in mine, we will still talk about it like A tier time space, even though we are judging those decks differently. So yeah, without further ado, let's start with an S tier. And I don't think there will there were, were any uh, like disagreements here with uh, between us with S tier decks. We, are, we both think that there are two clear S tier decks that are better than anything else right now. And the first one is Living End. Yes. So like, what do you think about that? Because you, you're the Living End expert here after all. Yeah, that's, that's actually true. Uh, Living End uh, got a lot from, uh, from the Lurus ban because one of the ways to attack uh, Living End was to loop 
na ich expert bomb or solve it later with Lurus. Uh, and now this engine is gone. So one of the very uh, important important ways to to attack the deck is uh, is not available uh, anymore. Um, outside that, uh, the meta game shifted in a way that Living Kent um, does not have many really bad matchups. Uh, for instance, if we if we would compare this moment uh, at the meta game to something in the first weeks of Modern Horizons 2, when Living Kent was also considered as Considered as really good. Mm, there, there were uh, like, for example, more burn, more blue white control with mind deck chalices. That was that was something new, hot, and really good. Nowadays, it's not that popular anymore. So there aren't any you know natural predators for for the living hand. Plus, living hand has tools to mm, to combat opponents' uh, interaction. Uh, which is kind of important because like people are preparing stronger and stronger um, to to beat this deck. Still, if you have grief, if you, if you have fawn and like all other uh, anti hit package for sideboard, you can quite easily break through one piece of hate. Uh, two piece of hate uh, are also available to deal with. After the third one, it's probably problematic. But if the opponent has three hate pieces, then their goldfish is probably much slower. So you can buy this time, or you can even win uh, regular games with you know, just Curator of uh, Mysteries and Shadow Sightings. I had these games already mm, in the last weekend. Overall, I think that right now Living End, in, end is in S tier, and mm, I also think that Living End and Rhinos, with both Cascade decks, can be a victim of its own success because. Once, uh, ca- like people realize that ca- casket is so popular and so and that many people are playing it, like the hate will be everywhere. And these decks, both Rhinos and, Cas- and Living and can fight for hate, but um, so it's losing percentage po- points here and there. So uh, if, for example, any deck can play that can play Chalice of the Void will play like two copies sideboard, then you will lose, for example, five percent. Uh, of win rate against basically anyone, which is a lot actually. And uh, in the long term, I feel that Living End won't last in S tier for, for that long. Right, right now, it's a really well positioned deck. Mm, and it also has a reasonable matchup with, with another S tier from, mm, from the list and a decent matchup versus all A tier decks. So it's a really good place to be. If you uh, want to play this type of kind of proactive game, but with reactive elements, it's probably the best what you can do right now in the format. Yep. I will add to what Sodek was saying that, in my opinion, like, if you think about how Living End plays out as a deck, like, it's so insane. It's so ridiculously strong. Like, going, you have three mana, one card combo that kills them in one or two turns. And you have zero mana discard spells and zero mana counter magic. And your combo is also sweeping your opponent's board. It's like, it's so ridiculously strong. And yes, it's susceptible to Chalice of the Void, to Cascade Hate like the Fairy or Fluster Storm, to, Ch- uh, to Relic of Progenitus or other ways to, uh, yeah, to, to hate on the graveyard, to counter magic, to discard. But one single way of interacting is usually not enough because of how efficient on mana living at this like they will use six mana on their first three turns usually and on top of that they will play at least one free spell usually so they will do like i don't know four or five different things and you have to match those four or five different things usually or at least those two or three that really matter like Grieve and their phone or Dispute and Cascade. And that's why, like, for example, I think like, for example, Teferi, I don't think Teferi is that great on, on the draw against Living End. Because no. it, like, it's much better against Rhinos because if you, even if they counter your, uh, your um, Teferi and Untap and Cascade, then you can just, I don't know, 
play Prismatic Ending on uh, Unholy Hit or play a Merc Tide that's 5-5 five, five, and we will block those Rhinos. And with Living End, if they force your Teferi or even Violent Outburst in response to Teferi and they will make like two striped river winders or something like that, <laughs> you'll just lose to that. And like back in the day, Living End was creating those huge boards with like Fulminators and a lot of that stuff. And these days, like one Grief, one striped river winder will kill almost everybody in like two turns. So yeah. I, I remember the times when Monstrous Carabit 4 4 must attack was the biggest threat for, for the Living End. I remember players. that some people were playing Jungle Weaver, which is 5 6 reach, but it cycles for two colorless two. because yeah. it was very large. And yeah, people were playing that. There was like a, a Swamp Cycler 6 3. There was also uh, later on, it was Ar Archfiend of Ifnir. Like yeah. Also, four, five, people five, were playing Webiax Clip, also known as uh, uh, Desert Serodon, the, the, yeah, the six four. Six four yeah. yeah, it yeah. was also played in the um, like before uh, Modern Horizons two when uh, Ardent Plea was the the second best uh, cascade spell for free mana because demonic direct requ requires having a target, which is a problematic for some time. Um, it was also. Played in the blue red like as foretold living and decks, I remember. Yeah. Well, well were, I think were, for a while. Yeah. But, yeah, but cool. yeah, in general, uh, living and is ridiculously strong as a like inherently, and you need to have a very good plan against living end. Uh, usually, multiple avenues of attack are re required to win against them. From what I've seen and experienced myself. I do think that one of the strongest cards against Living End, especially on the play, and especially if you are playing Ragavan in your deck, is Magus of the Moon. Like, they have few options to deal with Magus because they can't dispute it, they can't force of negation it, they can't force of vigor it, they can't use like Foundation Breaker and stuff like that. And if you go turn one Ragavan, turn two Magus, uh, they have two basics in their deck, and they need violent uh, they need forest to cast violent outburst they need island to bounce your magus with like uh, brazen borrower Tawara. And, Tawara. Uh, and because of the constraint that magus put on their blue mana they can't cycle under magus which is also really important so i i think magus is really good against living it of course chalice is good um fluster storm is good uh chip country magic is in generally pretty good like spell pierce is okay um, especially I'm, I'm when very, with like clock. Yeah, I'm like if someone would ask me what's the best hate against Living Hand, I would say like any one drop plus spell pierce. That's that's the way yeah. to beat the deck. Like uh, w w what I'm looking for when I'm playing against Living Hand is to keep like a hand, like two lands, relic of progeny to spell pierce. It's basically what I'm looking for, more or less. Yeah. But yeah, as we've said already, both of us have living in, in S tier and so uh, I'm a bit more optimistic about its uh, longevity in the S tier than Sodic is. Uh, I think like people will try to hate it out but they will either not play enough hate or they their hate will be too uniformed uh, and I do think that just by the virtue of its raw power because living and lost one of its like more challenging matchup with Death Shadow because Death Shadow was this unique deck that had the golden trifecta against combo, right? It has discard, counter magic, and very fast clock. And there are not that many like discard counter magic decks anymore. Like there are actually who zero plays, of those in our, who, our list, I think. Who plays discard nowadays? Like actually, in my opinion, discard not is a lot of really, really poorly positioned. Like if you need to com compete with expressive iteration slash omnat. That's just not well. Like, I, I actually think that is, this card is really good against for color from my experience when I played the Grixis. Uh, and but I think that okay, but it's like it, in my opinion, it's also really easy for them to rebuild. Like, if you have just this card, it's no, no, just no, no. Not, not of course, thing. coupled with counter magic. Like, yeah. uh, for example, if you are playing Merktite, you can splash black for this card spells out of the board, maybe. I don't know. And speaking of Merktite. It's the second deck that we have in our S tier, which is Merktide Regent or Blue Red Merktide, uh, also Jeskai Merktide that we're gonna talk about in a second. Uh, both the 
traditional builds with Dragon's Rage Channeler and uh, a bit larger builds without Channeler and with main deck planeswalkers like Jace or Teferi, Time Raveler. Um, so uh, basically for those of you who, who don't know, I managed to win a PTQ with, with Jessica Merktide last Friday. Um, and I was basically trying to merge the uh, traditional Merktide decks with blue-white control. And I started with like a build that's very that lent, leaned very heavily towards blue white with just like Ragavans and Bolts. And then uh, gradually I started moving the needle closer and closer towards Merktite uh, until I uh, until I uh, landed on this this bigger Merktite shell that we really need to find the name for so we can distinguish Merktite and like control Merktite basically. Uh, bigger Merktite. <laughs> bigger Merktite is not the most elegant name after all. So basically, yeah, uh, I think the first list uh, that we've seen with some having some success of the, those types uh, were from uh, Bomber Boss. I, I want to say that was their nickname, and they they get they got like top thirty two in a showcase, and then they top four the qualifier uh, on Monday, last Monday, which is Monday probably like ten days. Uh, ago when you are seeing this video uh, and yeah i when i saw this list i think it was really like I, I think it was nothing short of revolutionary for the archetype i don't think that you really need channeler anymore i think that the uh, the overall mana cost of modern went a bit up after lurus ban because you don't have death shadow and you don't have hammer so we don't need to have that many cheap spells to um, to like fight uh, with them on this like efficiency axis, but you get to you need to get a bit more muscle to like fight against uh, for color, which is a pretty important deck right now. And what you can do with just uh, just Dragavan in your deck and no channel there is you can actually switch to this more controlish deck seamlessly because you don't need to cut like six of your one drops you you just need to cut like a couple Ragavans uh, and then you can just load up your deck with like Archmage's Charms and counter spells and all those chips counters that we've already talked that are great against living and like spell peers uh, like Mystical Dispute, Spellsner. I think Spellsner is a very underrated card and it's been for, for a while. If you look at four color, most important spells in four color are like counter spell, uh, Ren and Six, Explosive Iteration, they all cost two mana. And managing to uh, to uh, answer them on the draw is super important. And when I was playing the, I think it was either quarterfinals or last round of Swiss, uh, in I think it was quarterfinals against Oda yeah. and Rakos. Uh, uh, they've had like they've played iteration on three and I spell spell snared it and then they played iteration on four and I snap spell snared it and it was like basically they were out of the game at this point. Uh, so yeah, I think that Merktite in general is great. I haven't really played the channeler builds because it just seems to me that those uh, builds without channelers but with main deck chases are way better now. Or maybe not way better. Like, Merktite even with channelers, it's still really, really good. But I, I would prefer playing without channeler. And uh, whether you play white cards or not, I don't think it's that important. Uh, I only played like main deck uh, endings and Teferis. I think Teferi is really good right now, even though I hate the card. Uh, so, especially out of a Ragavan deck, when you can turn to Teferi against Cascade decks. So you don't have the, this like tension of uh, you turn three Teferi, they answer it, and then they Cascade because you play it on turn two. So even if they are like, if you, especially if you're on the play, they, they just go to their turn two and what can they do? Not much. Uh, so yeah, whether you're playing white cards, not that important, but Merktite is really, really good right now. And if you are interested in playing like Fair Magic, uh, then I would just recommend playing Merktite. It's so good. Anything yeah, it's also deck? Uh, one thing is that uh, like once again, like compared to Linkent, it's really hard to find a deck that would crush Merktite. Like for color, 
used to do that, but the matchup is closer, especially if you are a bit bigger. Yeah, Hendrik. I got absolutely dumpstered by the blue white Emeria deck recently. <laughs> I think that deck is not very good. It's a mono white control deck after all, uh, in format like modern. But my draws were pretty bad. But with how the game plan of their deck felt, I really couldn't do much. So I think that if you want a deck that's like, if for some reason this deck is also good against Living End, um, it's kind okay. of okay because like, it's probably okay. It has like Teferi, it has Ranger Captain, it can has like it can have like Talia uh, or not Talia, Lavinia and Meddling Mage in the board. So like this Great might effect. be a good choice for the next few weeks when Merktide and Living and are on top, but then you will, for example, lose to four color because you are a fucking mono white control deck. Like, don't get me wrong, Sun Titan is a very strong card against four color, definitely. Uh, but but still, <laughs> I don't know, you're playing against you know, Yogmoth or something like that, and then you're, or Hammer, and you're probably just losing miserably. But yeah, yeah I think nothing really crushes Merktide. Yeah, like, the if you are uh, in a position when the decks that are beating that beat you are you know heavily meta gamed strange brews, that's probably a good position because like of course Merktide's matchups aren't you know that you know something like eighty twenty. It's more like fifty five forty five. For example, the matchup versus Rhinos is. I think it, the Merkite is a slight favorite, but it's not by that much. And that's fine because you can just play well, make good decisions. You have a lot of decision points during the, the game. Outside Bragavan survives, attack, and snowball. Mm, so you can uh, g get a few extra percentage points by just playing well and have a really good decision, decision making. Situations, something like this. I hope you understand all of this. Yep. Mm. Yeah, and also uh, something that, of course, it wouldn't be one of our uh, videos without mentioning uh, Dominaria's Judgment. Uh, mm -hmm. I uh, they've recently had had an episode about best decks in modern history, and they were talking about decks like Eldrazi, and how in a lot of people minds they were decks like. Uh, I don't know, like company that were allegedly very good against Eldrazi. And how if I of Ugin stayed unbanned, it probably wouldn't be the case after like month. But because what people would do at that point, that, that was Ari's theory, that uh, Eldrazi was so ridiculously strong against everything that they didn't really need, like, you are pre-boarded for Mirror because Mirror is the only matchup that really matters. So your sideboard slots are pretty free, free pretty freed up. And you can just put four Grav Digger's cages in your sideboard. And I don't think you are bad against the company deck anymore. And I think that is something that obviously much, uh, much uh, different scale. Um, Meritate is nowhere near as dominant as Eldrazi were. But you can do the similar things. Like you can definitely devote like one or two sideboard slots to some hate deck that will arise to to fight you. To be honest, like we we could already see that. Like the I saw the Merktide lists that were playing like two Flaster Storms, Chalice of the Void, two Relics, and like plus uh, outside that like four counter spells, three spell pierces, Archmage's Charm, etc. So the deck can adapt to, to basically every meta game, so just a very good place to be mm -hmm. moving forward. Because speaking of best decks, uh, it was like somebody mentioned that on Twitter, it was quite funny how people, uh, how when I think Ari and before, before them, because they've got, they've got the, an idea for the episode from Alex Majlaton, <laughs> who asked about the best decks, how, like, the answers were, were almost universally Eldrazi and Hogak, and it just shows that people haven't been playing Modo in Pandemic because they were like almost non-mentioned of the Valky Cascade deck, which was like 
by far the best deck that Modern has ever seen. I don't think it's particularly close. Yeah. Like, I can, like, there wasn't any deck that, that would like, beat that, actually. Like, I... like, it's insane that even if you are playing against Eldrazi, and they have like Chalice on zero against Cascade decks, usually, but your Cascade spell costs seven mana, so they can't even Chalice you. And they can go like, and imagine it now, you are playing Shardless Agent, so you don't need to play Ardent Plea anymore. Uh, you can play Fire Eyes, fucking Fire Eyes. You just go <laughs> Gemstone Caverns on zero, you just ice their land and then cast Valky. Like, no, this deck was insane. And if you if you have never, ne never saw it in action, I guess there are probably some YouTube videos on people playing those decks and those, and those like PTQs or challenges or whatever was up back back then. And if you honestly think that Eldrazi or Hogak are uh, like top decks of modern, like all time top decks for modern, go watch those, uh, this deck. It's, it's just it's so goddamn ridiculous. It was playing like main deck mystical disputes and the fairies for mirror, like. Uh, just... they, they were playing common deals because like. They were playing main deck very... common, like the deck was basically <laughs> pre-boarded for mirror and then it even had Again. more sideboard cards for mirror because it was the only matchup that really mattered yep yeah and it also lasted 10 days so go figure like even eldrazi lasted like month and a half two months yeah, i think even a bit more than that i i i think i think they pt eldrazi oh. was in february and i think that eye of Wugin was banned in right after bologna yeah, so I think it was two months. Uh, give me a second. I will confirm it for our viewers. Uh, I, oh, yeah. Uh, our friend uh, recently uh, posted on Facebook that it was six years. I think it was like yesterday from the ban. So, yeah. yeah. It was like two months. Yeah, two months versus 10 days. So, you know, you do the math. Okay. Uh, so, yeah. Without any more ado about best decks all time in modern and Merktite. We both have Merktite in S tier. And we can move to the place when things will actually get a bit more contentious and when we have some disagreements. But what? Yeah, but we'll start with something that we both agree on, which is four color, which is our first deck in the A tier. I would even go as far as say that I kind of wanted to make like an A plus tier. Uh, in which I would kind of want to put four color. I think four color is like distinctly the third best deck in modern. I think. I don't really agree that, with that. I'm not that sure because uh, the deck is kind of clunky still. Like it has its you know really powerful draws and like playing powerful cards is usually good. But like having a deck with fire cards does not mean that your deck is very powerful like it sounds strange but it's actually true uh, and like four color historically had a good match versus mertite but you know with more and more mertite builds um, trying to go bigger then suddenly um, this matchup isn't that easy because they have like more counter spells and uh, Mertek players are also trade up on mana with like huge and important friends, so um, it's relatively easy to to win a tempo tempo game unless they have like you know uh, an answer to solitude and you don't have another friend. This can be problematic, but overall, um, for color isn't as advantageous as it was before. For color also. Historically, had a you know reasonable matchup versus Living Hand, but uh, like mm, back in the days, they had more hate post sideboard. Now they have like Force of Negations most of the time, and maybe like two relics instead of like hard hate. So mm, I'm not very mm, high on the mm, on the four color, like a traditional one. I think that. Uh, other options uh, can be a bit better than that. Mm, still, playing a pile of good cards is ne nearly always at least a solid choice. So, mm, I totally mm, can see mm, it it being 
you know, uh, a way to go. Uh, still, I feel that for color, we lose a bit more, a bit too much against uh, decks from lower tiers because since it can, it can't mm, close out the game that fast, they can just lose to random stuff more often. Uh, so that's why uh, I'm not into A plus tier. I'm closing to A. And do you want to add something to that? Uh, yeah, I guess uh, about the Merktide for color matchup, I do think that uh, I felt okay in the matchup as long as you're playing the biggest, ver the bigger version of Merktide. I do think that you actually don't need to really care about them casting Solitudes if you have Jace in your deck. Um, and as you said, like the way you want the matchup to go if you're playing Merktide is to uh, answer their threats early on so the game devolves into just acting on each other end steps and you are much better at it because you have like four Archmage's Charms and hopefully you have some Snapcaster Mages as well and you can, mm -hmm. you know, just like they are playing Omna for four mana and you have like Mystical Dispute for one and Charm for f for uh, for free so you are spending four mana as well but you are like drawing two cards and drawing uh, toward like uh, Jace or Merktide or uh, even Ragavan when they are tapped out you can dash it and they have to Solitude it and they are losing more cards you can actually grind out for color quite uh, often with this deck, as long as you contain their early planeswalkers, like an unchecked like Ren and Six can be problematic, an unchecked Teferi can be problematic, definitely. So uh, unchecked Omnat once it resolves, yeah, it's that's, also that, that, that's also true. But but yeah, in general, I do think that for color is and definitely a, like a good choice as well. So yeah, both of us have it in a tier, but now. We are, we are kind, kind of still staying in the four color vicinity, uh, but here is when where our tier lists uh, start uh, diverging because we're talking about elementals and Sodek has elementals in A, while I have elementals in B. So Sodek, make your case. Why do you think elementals are as good or not better than? traditional for color in your opinion like i have like i was looking uh, for the reason uh, the reason is because like theo jung the player uh from mtgo got a really nice results like uh, probably top eight of the super ptq or top four i don't remember exactly but like uh someone asked me on twitter uh why elementals over for color and they said that cavern of souls can solo matchups and like we were talking about f how four color can lose a uh, tempo oriented battle with counter spells because you, you can't resolve form nothing or can't protect your solitude, etc. When you have a uh, cavern of souls ready, then the matchup versus Murtid is much easier. Uh, this is the, the first thing. Second thing is that mm, in the mirror you have reason reef, again, four color mirror, you have reason reef. So you technically can easier go for like go bigger, and once they like if if you are at the top top the core and go for your reserve reef, it's already uh, giving you the card back, and they need to react to that. And if they don't have a response immediately, um, it can run out with the game. Uh, Still, uh, elemental builds quite often does not have expressive iterations, so this is a cost of having reason reef in the deck. But it has another two, two drop that's an, another nice line of, of attack. It's called a Ladam Lisco. Mm, of, co of course, there's like some four color classic lists that are uh, also playing Ladam Lisco or elementals that are trying to play iteration. So Many strange things can happen in a four-color world, but overall, uh, elementals are more likely to play Eradamnis Call. And Eradamnis Call, uh, tutoring for Endurance, for Mending Mage, Lavinia, or just more Ronads, uh, is a nice way to um, to win matchups when 
um, card advantage is not everything that matters, and hate cards uh, can um, do the work. Uh, also, there's an argument about Utopia Sprawl. I'm not very high on that because you know, four color has Ragavan, so it kind it kind of does the same. Also, four color could play Utopia Sprawl, but we are not doing this. So for me, it's uh, cover of souls and it is not if as to and and Adam is calling this um, three differences that, in my opinion, puts elementals in in a really good position. And I'm actually surprised that uh, that once the tech was re rediscovered with cover of souls, uh, more four color players are not trying it out yet again. I do think that. Uh... And most of those people actually tried it a bit in the recent weeks. I think Canister played it as well. But I also think that, for example, this deck is much more susceptible than for than traditional four color against Blood Moon. Um, yeah, that's true. That's true. So Utopia Sprawl, like I, I don't know, are Elementals playing um, Abandoned Growth? I don't know actually. I think that because. Not all elementals lists are Kahira. Some of them are Yorion, right? Yeah, that's true. I think if they are playing so, Yorion, they are probably playing Grove. But if they are playing Kahira, they are not playing Grove. That would be my assumption. Oh. Yeah, that sounds reasonable. Okay, we'll check. Uh, okay, I get, get the Yorion list, and they are playing a Wooden Grove. Like I, I'm looking at the S S zero deck list from the from the PT. No, sorry, from okay. the challenge. Yeah, but they are not playing Renancid then. Right, no, they are playing. They are playing. So, 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 so what the are they package not is, playing? The place poker package is here. Uh, maybe like it's an, it's a Yorion deck, so it's easier to pack everything. Yeah, but uh, like, they are playing Risen Reefs and they are playing Eladam Call. No, uh, okay, sorry. They are also playing Eladam Call and Reefs. Yes, that's also a Reef. So they are not playing what? Ragavan, right? They don't do not play Ragavan because and they don't play know, iteration, right? They don't play iteration. So they they don't... are playing Risen Race and Eladam Call instead of Ragavan and iteration, more or less. Kinda and also okay. like some uh, stuff like they have one subtlety, one Knight of Autumn Endurance, two Mold Drifters, one Titania Protector of Fargor, but yeah, it's yeah. still like so... very very deck is dependent on. Yeah, but in general, to play, oh, you know? are they playing Counter Spell? Probably not. No, that's another card that. Is important for color. Like basically, in my opinion, you are well, first of all you are more susceptible to Blood Moon, especially if you are leaning on like Cavern of Souls to mm -hmm. get the job done against Counter Magic. And also, I do think that playing like Rack of an Iteration and Counter Spell is a is an even better plan to beat up on decks against which card advantage does not matter all that much than like Ladamri's call for a hate card. I do mm -hmm. think that having this core like. Playing turn one Ragavan and holding up counter spell is really good against those decks. I uh, don't think so. Like more the most uh, popular um, linear decks. Let's let's say that Living End is, is a linear. Okay, one. it's not that great against Living End. That's true. Yeah, it's like they are really well equipped to fight through counter spell. It's better to play something that uh, that are proactive in terms of you don't need to hold up mana all the time. Or uh, your interaction is for free. That's, that's true. Awesome. But also, Ragavan is a very good mana engine against those decks. So maybe even yeah. if, if Ragavan counter spell is not that great, Ragavan into the fairy is pretty good against Living End. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, so also, I think like Ragavan counter spell is good against like non Living End linear decks. Like if you're playing against, I don't know, like uh, a Tron deck, maybe Amulet, this kind of stuff. Ragavan into counter spell is pretty good. I. Yeah, I'm, so. I'm kind of down on counter spell against uh, against uh, amulet because recently when I'm playing against amulet, I'm playing against canister when we are testing, and canister has four main deck cavern of souls, so uh, <laughs> it's not very easy to win game one against this deck. And I think it's actually something that makes a lot of sense to me because it's basically you are playing more bosages in the sideboard and you are playing caverns in the main deck because against most decks, cavern is more important than bosage right now. True. And you just have like, four main deck caverns, and you will have cavern every game, basically. And then your Ragavan counter spell plan is just not much work. worse. Yeah. Yep. 
Okay. Uh, so uh, yeah. Bas so basically, why I have elementals in B instead of A is that I believe more in Ragavan iteration like counter spell than I believe in Risen Reef and uh, like Eladam Skull. That's that's why I have it a bit lower, but it's still like an okay deck. Uh, and definitely not something that you should be ashamed of playing or anything. Uh, okay, uh, next up on our list, we do have the ones King of Modern in various, I guess, spots in time, and that's Hammer. And how might he have fallen? Basically, uh, they lost, yeah, they, they fall like when they're losing flying from Hammer. Yeah, like now I I kind of remember our conversation in, in the last uh, metagame update uh, video when you were very high on the hammer post one and I was saying like man, like this Lurus was giving the deck more than we we thought and that's that's kind of the case because Lurus turned out to be a you know very important engine against uh, disenchant effects for example if people were playing Force of Vigor, then eventually Lurus would, would help them rebuild, etc. Now this engine is gone, and the deck is a bit weaker. Still, Lurus uh, looping the rest down is not the case, but Force of Vigor is still really good. That's true. And, like, That's the, true. Also, like there are many other cards that can stop Hammer, but if you don't have these cards, you very often die on turn 3. And just because of it, I feel that Hammer is a really like really well positioned deck. Okay, maybe it's not very well positioned, but it's like raw power is so inc incredible that it can be in a lower position and, and still be fine. Like if we compare this, like it has a decent matchup versus Merktide, struggles against Living Hand, uh, probably both four color versions, both four color traditional and elementals have. A good time against Hammer. There are also like many other decks, for example, versus Rhinos, Hammer should be quite well positioned. Although without Lurus, it's not that uh, that easy still. Mm, the deck is very stable. The deck does its thing. It it it's also uh, the only okay. I mean, we have Amulet, but that true saga deck with a lot of uh, artifacts and then this is the, the only deck that can produce really big constructs in my opinion urza saga right now looks really good and i'm i'm a bit surprised that more urza decks aren't at the top tier right now uh, so hammer is the, the only one that can uh, make a good use of urza saga and can use like all of its, its chapters really, really nicely. So that the, there are like the biggest pros mm, to to play the deck. There, there are also some cons, and I think that Yendrik will, <laughs> will, will say that. Okay, so first of all, uh, yeah, that's true that Hammer definitely is not as popular as, uh, as before the Lurus ban, but I actually think that, once again, the biggest uh, a reason for that is not internal, it's external. I do think that the rise of Living End really hurts Hammer. It's True. not a good matchup for Hammer at all. And I think that having such a decisively bad matchup, I'm not saying it's tragic, it's definitely like there are no unwinnable matchups in Magic in general. But having a matchup that you don't want to face being one of the most popular decks, like two more, not even one of the most popular, like five decks, like one of the two most popular decks. And the other one, I think, like against Merktide, if Merktide is going bigger, it's also not great for Hammer because one drops is, are usually not that great. And people start having like, they have slots because they are playing main deck Jaces. They have sideboard slots that before were Jaces and now they are playing like Furies in the sideboard. Fury is another Look. good card against Merktide. Uh, against also Hammer, the, rather. Also, there's more Archmage's Charms in Merktide list. Also, like, yeah. we were, we were in, like, like three months ago, there was, like, one, two, one, maybe two. Now, three is the the start, and the, quite often you see four copies. So, yep. uh, this is not the best, the best uh, information for, for Hammer. Yep. 
still I'm very very high on the deck and it crashes most of the lower tier decks and can prepare for for higher higher tier decks. For for instance, um, I saw a Flasian list and uh, he had like Lavinia, Spell Pierces, Void Mirror, uh, and uh, Grave Hate for one mana. And it was like, okay, that's that's a big dedication because like instead of Mm, this one mana protection spell from Modern Horizons 2. Blacksmith skill. Yeah, Blacksmith skill. You, you just play Spell Pierce because it, Spell Pierce also protects your key spells, but also can stop Cascade decks, etc. etc. You, you play Lavinia because it stops both Fast Fury slash Solitude and Cascade decks. So it's possible for Hammer to, to catch up with, with the right sideboard. But like the position is not as dominant as as it was with the Lurus around. Yep. Uh, so yep. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, we, and, and before the show, we were talking about that, and uh, Sadek pointed out uh, very accurately that in the Sunday challenge there were four hammer decks in top eight, I think. Uh, so yeah, definitely something you still have to uh, be mindful of definitely still a strong presence in the format and we both bo both have hammer in a tier um yep and um moving on we, we have another deck in the year a tier that we both agree on and that's rhinos uh so uh back in like october and like november i was really high on rhinos i thought that rhinos were pretty great i've Never played the game of the deck, but I still think that it was pretty much one of the best decks in the format. Never quite made S tier, but it was in A tier for a long time. And then when Shadow became more popular, then I got kind of down on the deck because I do think that sh that Rhinos used to struggle against Shadow. And now with Shadow gone, I think Rhinos can go back to being in like comfortably one of the like top five ish decks in modern um just basically the same thing that sodex said about hammer i think is true again, about rhinos like rhinos just dismantles nonsense so easily true like i've said that a million times i will say, that, say it again playing turn to fire eyes on your opponent land and then cascading into eight or, or half of the time 10 power uh just puts a real strain on what you can do, especially if they can just follow it with like force of negation or another ice to slow you down further. Uh, so, yep, Rhinos just great deck, uh, and they can uh, really make use of some great sideboard cards because Living End, for example, can't really play Blood Moon. Rhinos can. Rhinos even play Blood Moon the main deck these days sometimes. So. Yeah. I do think that Rhinos are definitely like higher floor than Living End, but lower ceiling than Living End. Is basically what I'm yeah. saying. It's, it's more like uh, less, uh, basically more flat distribution of like power and win rate than Living End. Yeah, you always you always put eight power on board and don't rat opponent's board, but you use your Furies and Dead Guns and and you don't use graveyard. Yeah. So there is. So yeah, one, one, like, like what one, one avenue of attack against you yeah. is just that. And yeah. yeah, I think dead gun is something that you mentioned dead gun, which is I think really important because a lot of, uh, I think a lot of power in living and hate or hate against living and rather is that living and is not a great deck in answering creatures, especially if they are non-blue because they can't fun it. Uh, they can't dispute it if they are non-blue. So like Magus, uh, people are playing like Lavinia and Meddling Mage in, tr in, in Hammer. But maybe if they are uh, concerned... Well, I guess you are not bringing dispute against Hammer, are you? I am right now. So if you if people <laughs> start bringing dispute against Hammer, Hammer then can switch to Dranith Magistrate, I guess. For example. Mono-white like, cards, so yeah. Also Creatures Hammer are... plays... Hammer right now plays Teferi. So, so that and spell pierce, so they're more than enough targets for mystical. Vision. That makes sense, and they are all like important targets. They are not like I don't know. It's not like their memnites suddenly became blue. It's like 
the important cards are blue now. Uh, and yeah, so yeah, back to rhinos. I, I, I think rhinos are just a very solid deck. And uh, if you if you like, like, it's basically if you're a mid range player that ca uh, that comes to modern and want to play something that's not Merkite Regent, I think rhinos is like one of your best bets. It's just yeah, a very very tempo. good mid range deck. I think a tempo is, is maybe even better. Describe yep. what rhinos can do. Yeah. It's it's very hard hard to classify Rhino of like one one of these archetypes. Like it's yeah, not it's true. not entirely a tempo deck. It's not entirely a mid range deck. It's not really a combo deck. It's more of a it's more of a like some combo hate is good against it. Uh, yeah, but like, about about the hate, I, every time I'm playing Rhino of Prick against them, I'm like very impressed how good rhinos how well rhinos can play around uh, around the height for instance opponent has teferi on board like for living hand if you lost this battle and, and teferi is on board that's most likely gg um, for rhinos it's not the biggest problem because you have stuff like for example bone crusher giant and then you hard cast your guys you have fury to hard cast you have fury to to evoke so uh the brazen borrower you can i like if the opponent uh, is too focused on the hate it's relatively easy to to win the game with just you know good draft creatures yeah like you play stomp into four free into basically anything into fury and then you can win if opponent like wasted like two cards and two turns for for the hate for the cascade yeah, okay, so I have to ask you this question. Are you high on rhinos because you have a, a, a rhino plush toy on your bed behind you? Yes. Okay, you, you can't see it in uh, at the, on the camera, yeah, uh, so but I actually do see it and it's it, 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 it even looks kind of similar. I think it could be a 4-4. Four -four. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so how uh, how big is the panda that you usually have here, in your five, opinion? Five six. Panda is five six. It, it's quite bigger, bigger than this rhino, so I I assume five six is fair. It's a, yep. You know, I, okay. I ask her. Okay, so moving down to the B tier, uh, first deck that we both have in B tier, uh, I kind of wanted to put it in A tier because it was supposed to be. Pretty great after Lurus got banned, but then it, I think you can safely say, as always or as usual, uh, failed to perform, uh, which is not the problem you, you really like to have, failing to perform. Mm -hmm. And this deck is, well, you all know what it is. It's Amulet, of course. And yeah, every time uh, people say that Amulet is, it will be great, it's great for a week, and after that it disappears. Uh, from what I saw on MTGO, people like had a really high, like big respect for the deck, and I saw more than enough Magus of the Moon um, to stop Amulet. But because again, Magus of the Moon is really hard for Amulet to 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 deal with, because unlike Force of Vigor versus Blood Moon, Magus can't be healed that way. Um, so there's that's a really tough one already. Mm. And uh, about the the engine alone, Bosedru uh, is a really important card uh, nowadays because Amulet got this extra line of attack that can use, for example, versus Hammer. Now you can go for the Titan and keep Bosedru not die uh, uh, and go nuts next turn. Or uh, you can deal with, uh, again, Blood Moon, you deal with uh, Something like strange stuff like dumping sphere, uh, attack opponents' lands, etc., etc. Bosser is a really good card, uh, but it's not enough because, like, still, um, primeval titan's biggest problem was that it dies to unholy hit, and we've meched it around and holy hit around and living and around, which is not the big, the best matchup ever. I'm not very high on. Amulet right now. It's still a really good deck. It still has its gold, gold fish potential. So if you 
draw well uh, during the tournament, you can set up a lot of turn free kills that will be quite hard to interact with. Still, um, I think a bit too many cards are attacking the deck at the moment to, to let it shine. Yep. All I have to say about that is that, uh, yeah, Marcus of the Moon is a really good card, and if you are playing Amulet, you, I would, or not you, I would uh, recommend playing for Cavern of Souls. I think that's something that, this way, I think you are pretty big favorite against Merc Tide Game 1, if you have four Cavern in the main deck. And then yeah, can... you have to hope to dodge Magus of the Moon in one of the sideboarded games. And I think which that's, is, that, that's a plan you want to have against Merktite, and that, that makes the matchup like okay-ish, I guess. Uh, so I, yeah. I think it, it can even be like, if you have four Cavern of Souls, I think that Amulet can be slightly advantaged. Yep, one, definitely. So easy. All right. Moving onwards to a new addition on our list. Uh, made some waves in modern like i want to say two weeks ago three weeks ago winning the showcase in hands of musa sabi it was blue or black green saga uh, and back in the day we've had jan saga here and now we've decided to go with uh, black green saga and then jan decks of any variety in their own category so here we're gonna sp speak strictly about the black green version of the deck, uh, which is, in my opinion, uh, the best place to cast Tarmogoyfs right now. I do think that Saga, as Sodek said before, Saga is a pretty well positioned card right now. It helps you win against, uh, it can help you against Living End, uh, pretty substantially because it's well they will have like force of vigor against you and stuff like that but it still can if you're on the play and you play saga on turn one you can still get soul guide lantern before they can living end um, plus i guess if you really want to do that you can have bojuka book under elvish reclaimer um, you can have a bunch like you, you are still a like Fozzy Starmogai deck which is which which can which can put like a pretty fair amount of pressure on your opponent. Um so yeah, I do think that uh Black Green Saga is a pretty good deck right now. And Wither Blue Command is a card that we I guess we haven't talked about uh before. And it pairs or it matches really well against two important threats in the format, which is Ragavan and Renan 6 because uh, you can kill Renan 6 and you can kill Ragavan with the card and if you manage to kill one of those or ideally both uh, so if you kill both then you are golden of course but if, even if you kill only one of those cards because they rarely belongs to the same deck basically only in for color uh, and I guess Jant but who, who cares about Jant uh, <laughs> Basically, if you if you manage to kill Ragavan and uh, or Ren and Six while doing something meaningful with your card, uh, like bringing back Saga, uh, bringing back even nurturing Pitland or Takenuma, some ways to like get more card advantage, it's a really good deal for two mana. So it's a really good deal. So yeah, I'm I'm a fan of Saga right now. Like, well. Of course, relative fan of Saga because it's an A, B tier, not A or S. But I think, once again, if you want to cast Fotis and Tarmogoyfs, I think I would have, I would go towards Black Green Saga. Yeah, John, John the guy should should abandon Red and just focus on the claimer. I'm I'm about the deck. I not I'm not the biggest fan of being so high on with a saga while you don't have that many artifacts so for example when i was talking that hammer is the the best saga deck around because like it had also other artifacts so constructs will also be really good and really big In so this deck, did you it's did not, you forget it's, about tireless tracker it's only it one copy clues. in in it's only one copy clues. in the list okay that's that's a true. lot of clues it, 
in an extreme late game situation, I can uh, I can believe that it can be really good. But outside that, you are playing like, good cards in black and green. Plus, there's a saga which is more of a tutor target or a, a plan for the late game because you should play more because you can just tutor for it and like use your mana every turn. Mm, one for me, the biggest problem for this deck is that the deck tries to do very similar thing compared to Pork Color, but it does it a bit a bit worse. You just trade your uh, like counter spells with this card, and like your your removal package is a bit different. But outside that, I just don't feel that the deck is is better at grinding than than for color. I'm very curious how the matchup versus Merktite would look would look like. In paper, it looks it should be really good because Liliana of the Veil should dominate Merktite. But I I never saw it in practice, so it's kind of hard for me to yep. uh, to guess. Still. I, I... Mm -hmm. I think it's. I, I think the matchup against Marquez should be okay, and yeah. also I think that what Saga is trying to dominate really the black green deck is like smaller creatures. I think it's pretty great against rhinos. Like you just uh, disrupt their important card, and then you don't even have to care about the first rhinos really because you just land like a five six Tarmogoyf, and if you manage to uh, find a Shadow Spear with Saga, then like. A G -G. six, seven, or even seven, eight Talmgrave with Lifelink, like it's really hard for them to beat that. Uh, also, I do think that most of the time the way they achieve more artifacts for their saga is that they rebuy it and you get the double saga situation, and then their constructs like they will have like two constructs from each of those sagas plus an artifact they find, so they will have like three or four like five fives or six sixes. It obviously takes time to get there, but uh, I think that while they won't be as uh, impressive as the Hammer constructs, they will still get the job done, especially backed up by like Fatal Push and Foxes and Liliana. Like you don't need to have a, like to have an 8-8 or 9-9 uh, construct if you are using Liliana every turn. Like you will just mop them up with like 4-4 or whatever. Like you, you did for years with Tarmogoyf. True. Like the only like also one thing that I would love to to see being changed is when I, like I see like I'm looking at the Musa Sabi list and like free the confident free doughty like we already were talking about this uh, in our Polish podcast and I just don't feel that these cards are are really well positioned. Like doughty is really good versus the weekend. That's for sure. And it also should be good, like it, it requires to be healed versus Merktite because you won't be able to cast Merktite on time. So maybe Doughty is the way to go. I'm not sure about Confident at all. And uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe something new will be found like moving forward. We'll see. So far, I feel this is the best Armogov deck and like. Probably the only one that can do anything in this format. Yeah, I guess the second Tarmogoyf deck that can do something is uh, all those people, or all those people. It says like it's something popular, while in reality, like per maybe two, per two people on the planet are doing mm -hmm. that. Is Splash Tarmogoyf into Merc that we saw that a couple months ago from Harlan Fierer on Star City. Uh, but yeah, uh, but uh, regarding those two drops that saw that just. Uh, was talking about. I don't know what Doty is. I assume you you meant Voidwalker, and I think it's a pretty pretty okay card. And as far as uh, and as far as uh, confident go, what I like is that it even screws people who decide to play blue white, like even further. Uh, so that's what I like about confident. And it's also like it's probably your best to drop against like hammer or. Uh, those type of decks like that that's how you usually beat like small creature decks with with giant you or like amulet as well i guess you just play turn to confident and you hope that you draw enough good cards uh to slow them down even further 
to the point in which you draw enough cards that you will just bury them in card advantage. Like that's what that's what basically uh, our friend Duo from Poland, uh, pretty pretty great player as well. Uh, he played a lot of Jant, and when I when I talked to him on many occasions about like what do you think about this? How do you want? To, how was your plan against this or that? Very often his answer was, okay, so I played Dark Confident on turn two, and then uh, they Confident draws me like two or three cards, and well, I'll try to win with those extra resources. And I think it's still, like, obviously it's not as good in, like, uh, like it's, it's a tool for linear decks mostly, because if you're playing against, like, four color, and you play Confident, and they play, play Rensky, you are extremely sad. Uh, but yeah, Still, there are a bunch of like proactive linear deck in format, and I think against those decks, Confident is still a really good card after all these years. Yeah, I, I don't know about the free free split of Void Walkers and Confidence, and I don't really have opinion on that. But yeah, okay. Shall we go to the next deck on our list? Also a new edition. Yes. And that deck is a deck that we actually talked about multiple times, and we uh, we considered adding it to the list multiple times. Uh, but we finally pulled the trigger on that, and that deck is Blue Red Underworld Breach. Um, and I guess uh, we both like a bunch of things about the deck, but I think you, you were a bit more excited than I was about this addition, so I will let you let you speak first. Which is kind of interesting because I I'm I'm not putting the deck in a B tier. I'm putting this in a C and. Why? Which is kind of interesting. Um, I think the deck has a, a lot of potential, and I feel that the deck can be really good. It can have its place in a meta game as a this type of tempo, like some something similar to Splinter Twin. Of course, not that powerful, but something that plays a tempo game can create a, a slight advantage, like with Raga, Vantir, C, Emery, etc. But you can always have this I win the game button um, and win the game. What, why uh, playing this type of splinter twin deck in nowadays is not that important? Because earlier, uh, like when splinter twin was legal, if you always had to um, keep responses for it, you had to like, keep your mana untapped all the time. Uh, which is not the problem at the moment because like we have so many good free spells that can uh, stop underworld breach that like this tempo aspect is negated significantly. We have like endurance, endurance exiling uh, a graveyard in response to underworld breach looks really powerful. We have um, force of negation, we have force of vigor, uh, we have grief from living hand, etc. Uh, etc. Et uh, it's relatively easy to attack the deck. Also, the deck uses basically anything, like any form of um, like zones and any form of uh, permanents that, that you can use to... So it also means that it's quite easy to attack the deck. For instance, the deck uses graveyard, so graveyard effect is really good. The deck plays artifact and an enchantment because you, you need to underworld bridge and grading station. So both Shatter and like, the Strange Enchantment. Like, the Mystify. The Mystify. Uh, effects are really good. Mm, also, the deck requires to have a creature on board. Uh, so Mox Summer can, can give you mana. So from time to time, you, you will even lose to, to a creature removal. So the deck looks clunky. But on the other hand, uh, the deck has a really big potential to to fight through all of these soft uh, cards to interact. For, for instance, if opponent is trying to, to play a Shatter on your grinding station, you can just prepare more mana and be able to recast it once Underworld Bridge is on, in play. So that's the same to attack. Also, the deck plays Erza Saga. So again, this deck plays a lot of other artifacts, so as a saga tokens will be really big, which in my opinion is really important for the deck because this saga tokens can steal games and can you know go for the hate card instead of the combo piece. 
and stop the opponent from doing anything. So I think the deck has potential. I saw a really good uh, Underworld Bridge deck guide. I don't remember who, who posted it, uh, but it's somewhere online. Yeah, it's uh, their name is Jesse, I think. Uh, I think their Twitter handle is Tidipels, but I'm not 100% sure on yeah, the I, spelling I, here. I... Uh, they, 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 they've like won or top four some of the Star City Games tournaments. I, I don't remember which one. Uh, I think their guide is on TCG Player. Yeah, uh, and I, like the, this guide was was at the level that when I was reading it, I was like, I felt strange because I shouldn't be able to to read it for free. Like yeah. basically, yeah, it was. It was, it was uh, I haven't read it, levels. but I've glanced through it. Like I scrolled through it, and it was a lot of content in it. Yeah, yeah, like a lot of work to do. So, yep. Uh, so, overall, okay. else to yeah, add about overall, 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 I think that like right now I give it in C because I want it to prove that it can be in a higher tier. I think it has cards good enough to to reach. B tier and be a comfortable B tier B tier deck for 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 a while. For instance, I feel that Underworld Bridge and Amulet are kind of similar because like a lot of cards can attack you, and you have other ways to do once they are attacking your your things. So this deck can have its moments, but like it's harder to find a good window. Because there are so many different cards that can attack your your combo game plan. Still, thirty three kills. Like if you can do this, and this deck can, um, is something that. Yeah. Basically, can be if your deck enough. can kill on turn three, it's gonna only be so bad. Uh, it, or, well, it, I guess. Not, I guess uh, storm okay, is terrible. Okay. Even though it oops, can kill. spells are also also kinda. Uh, kind of ambitious right now to 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 play, but it's a turn free deck, turn free combo deck that can play a longer game because you have tools to to play. It's you have expressive iteration after all, yeah. So you have Ragavan, you have Urza Saga. So yeah. just based on these really powerful cards, you can win games of Magic. So yeah. I would love to to say in in our next. Uh, meta game update that Underworld Bridge is higher than C and. I honestly believe that it will happen. So far, I'm a bit more skeptical, a bit like I want to see how it will perform, how many people will, will actually try the deck, how many good players will try to combo out with it, etc. etc. You want to see, so that's why it's in the C tier. Nice. But yeah, so about, uh, about our next update, because some people asked me, uh, with the joint update for meta game that we had for February and March, will we switch to doing it every two months or will, will we stay with our previous model of doing it every month? We will stay with monthly upgrade, uh, upgrades. We just felt like not much has been happening and we kind of wanted to make a February update, but it was like Kamigawa was coming like in the middle of the month and then it would be kind of obsolete after like for the for half a month and we didn't want that to happen um and about bridge so two things that i wanted to mention is first uh, the the twin argument uh, about hate so something i wanted to mention uh, about uh, those things like that's true what sodek said that uh, you used to have to keep your mana up against twin and now you have zero mana answers, which is true. Uh, you also have Unholy Heat and Fatal Push, which can answer, like, hi hypothetically, it could answer twin creatures for one mana. But also what is important is, and is kind of overlooked from time to time, is that you, you, you used to have to respect their combo potential, and not only you had to have open mana, you also had to have, like, Terminate against Blue Red Control post-board. Like, they were playing like Keranos or Jay's Architect of Thought, and your hand was like Path to Exile or Terminate or Abram Decay or whatever. And these days, your removal is so versatile that the same thing does not really apply. Like, it's quite hard to build a deck that will be like a modal deck. Like, you have this combo plan, uh, and then you switch into more of a like 
control is your fair or mid range plan, and none of your and your deck is good against like an holy heat or uh, prismatic ending post bolt. Those cards will likely still be good against you. And about the bridge deck itself, like it's true that you can attack it from different angles, but also what it means is that in that case is that if they have too much grave hate against you, you will just beat them with Ragavan and Saga. If you have too many disenchants, you can just play Ragavan uh, or combo them out. Uh, I guess disenchants are good against combo, but still, you can just Ragavan them out or Darcy them out. So you have to have a nice equal spread of, or even spread, uh, of, of those uh, interaction cards, which is also important. Uh, yeah. And one more thing, what I wanted to say about the deck. Oh, it was about Storm, sorry. Like, it it's so weird for, because you mentioned the expressive iteration like you're playing a blue red like the, st about storm it's like it's a blue red spell based kind of low curve deck and you don't play iteration and it's just so weird uh, like I, I i get iteration does not really play into like storm strengths but still having this insanely powerful card draw and you can't play it in your deck it, it gotta feel bad especially with like close to zero amount of love that Storm got from Wizards in the last five years or whatever. Uh, yeah, yeah, you got Wish, you got like Galvanic Relay and some some stuff, but for yeah, the most part... Galvanic Relay is really, really powerful, I have to say that. Like, I lost like, to this yesterday and... Like, yep. Yeah. Like, the the yeah. last time Storm got like a really important upgrade was Baral, right? True. It was like six years ago or something. But yeah. Also, like, I'm thinking about like this Underwood Bridge and like two things uh, that I, I came to conclusion that this is a really, like probably the best expressive iteration deck because you have you, you can very easily play this on turn two and hit something for zero mana. You have Mox Amber, you have uh, Bubble. Misha's Bubbles, and like some like Tor one script was I with whatever. Uh, uh, I don't know about that. Like on one side, so one hand you have those cards. On the other hand. Four of your lands are Erza Saga that can't cast it. Okay. <laughs> so like I I think it's like it's it has definitely potential to be great expressive iteration deck, but also when uh, if, while we are talking about like expressive iteration decks, uh, I think the part of a problem with Breach is that if you are playing against other Ragavan decks uh, and you are trying to play this like Ragavan Unholy Heat expressive iteration game. They will draw Counterspell and Merktite, and you will draw Mox Amber and Grinding Station. So I think yeah. you will like <laughs> trade resources, and then they will top deck powerful cards, and you will top deck combo pieces after you got disrupted. So I, I think yeah, that so you should be kind of worried about your Ragavan like mirrors, quote unquote yeah, matchups. Like, like like I was I was talking to, to the one guy who was like in the Saturday's challenge. He was six zero and ended six two and got ninth in the ninth place and uh, they said that like matcha versus four color is unlosable which i totally like believe that it can, can be the i case. don't believe in unlosable matchups but i can no, see how okay, like, like, i can really, i can see how good, the deck yeah. is good again yeah, and like I, I asked about like i was like leaving and it, it looked maybe maybe not very easy but like because they were able to to break through like one phone one whatever because they had like creatures to 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 attack me, but like I like after the cyber, like I had so many different options to attack them. So it was easy. I was like asking them about the merc like match, and they were like, "Yeah, I'm winning, but I shouldn't because people don't know how what to do against me." The the last thing about the underwood bridge, I'm curious how often post cyber bridge is played to draw like free cards from Misha's bubble. Because like I, I assume that that can be gains when you side out most of your combo and play Underworld Bridge as a two mana draw, three draw for cards. And that's you that's can ask our friend, friend Lori about that because he's the biggest Underworld Bridge for value hater of all time. Why? <laughs> we were playing we we're playing Cube at some point and he drafted a mono red deck and he had a he was playing because he's obsessed with like uh, uh, single Elim like pot drafts, not league drafts. So you can actually hate pick and they, he was playing mono red and he had a choice of playing, of taking track task to like hate draft or to 
take underworld bridge to like you know you play underworld bridge and you play like lightning body twice from your graveyard or something like that in like 10-4 or something and i was like dude that's a pretty good card in like mono red uh, deck and cube you can just draw two cards for two mana on like 10-5 or whatever and he was like mordo you don't know what you're saying and i was like mordo i know what i'm saying have you ever played this card and he was like mordo i haven't mordo basically means dude in polish for those of you who are wondering but yeah so shout out to to Lori and uh, for those of you who are wondering what's my take on bridge power level i do think it's a b tier deck uh, i basically think that it's already where sodek wants it kind of to be maybe not as high as sodek wants it to be but i am excited to see if it can go even higher so similarly to sodek i think that bridge is just starting like it will get better i think uh okay i think maybe not better but more players will yeah yeah like more refined like or around, yeah? whatever okay but uh speaking of decks that won't get better and it will stay the same forever we've got burn because burn is just <laughs> the same fucking lava spike from champions of kamigawa <laughs> is still dealing free damage and the same goblin guide is attacking every turn and like like the more nothing... the more things change, the more things stay the same, basically. And... Yeah, like, like that's really hard to say it's something new about Burn. Like maybe from the meta game perspective, the matchup, like the matchup uh, spread right now is kind of good for Burn because both Cascade decks, like Living Kent, like Burn, is a slight advantage. Like uh, like it's a play draw and Living Kent is forced to to draw Grief plus ten free Cascade with a good mana. Or like like two fawn, fawns and having a painless mana base to have a chance. Mm, similar to rhinos, uh, which are like have a bit better matchup, but they close out the game a bit slower compared to living end. So it's easy. And Eidolon versus Cascade decks is a really cool one. So mm, I've, I think this is the biggest advantage of playing Burn right now because like with more Cascade decks, you have more. F- Three wins, Yendrek. So how many? How, how much burn does have to be in the meta game for you to go back to Brindlebore, and Living End, or some other cards like that? Like no to the bone. <laughs> uh, like no to the bone is the the worst card. Like yeah, because you don't ever have, ever play. You don't because have like, as many creatures even in that deck. I think. Like in Living End, you can even have creatures. Like I, we assume you cycled three creatures on turn one and two. Compared, six like, life. You it's play, not that yeah. Much. You play. You play. No to the bone. Gain six life, and then opponent like, okay, you take three from Eidolon. I attack you for two, and like do anything else. And like so, Brindlebor. You, hold, you, yeah. you say Brindlebor is the future. I think Lena of Sanctity is the future if you want to build burn. Like I, I, I was. I'm not the biggest fan of Lena of Sanctity in Living Camp because you you cycle so much. Uh, but sometimes it's necessary. And Maybe like the match. Mm-hmm. Maybe you can go to uh, the same route that uh, Doomwake did in Rhinos, and you can just sideboard in Core Firewalker and Cascade into Core Firewalker. Uh, that's just probably like Cascade into Free Firewalkers and just kill them. With I them. was thinking about it, but uh, it's much better in Rhinos when you already have you know Furies and, and other beatdown plan of sorts. Yeah, reasonable beatdown plan in. Uh... In living can it's probably not doable, sadly. Uh, maybe okay, you can do this, and uh, if you win the game uh, in your LGS versus Bern, please message us. Know. Message us, and Sodek will <laughs> yeah. play it. What? One hundred percent. Okay. Uh, so about other matchups, matchups versus four color is kind of fine because like the mana base is quite painful. I think it's good. I think that yeah, most. Uh, I I think that most four color players are actually. Kind of scared about uh, against uh, about burn like uh, if you don't have omnaf on turn four or even f- faster like if, if you go ragavan into turn three omnaf that's obviously pretty great against burn but usually I do think that mm, you can not quite easily but I do think that okay uh... sorry for that uh, I, I do <laughs> think that burn is kind of happy to play against four color just don't 
suspend your rift bolts if they can play Teferi next turn. True. Just don't do but... that. I recently played against Capeshift and they uh, and they uh, uh, suspended Search on one and I teferi them and they just conceded the match. <laughs> the match. <laughs> well, they conceded the game and then they conceded the second game like t- on turn three when I, I don't know, countered something. <laughs> Too much, so. literally too much. Okay, so before you, you start thinking that Bern is, you know, really well positioned because you yeah, have a good cost coit matchup, etc., there are still problems. And the biggest problem is the the best deck probably in the format called Merktide. And Merktide has a slight advantage. This is not the, the highest advantage ever, but the matchup usually goes to I cast Merktide, and if I ever untap with Merktide, I have counter spells to stay alive and kill you with Merktide. So this is, you know, not the best place when when ben, ben wants to be. Still on the play, you can quite often deal enough damage. So if if I ever tap out to Mer- for Merktide, you can kill them in response. Uh, still, also Mecha versus Hammer is kind of bad. So um, so these two matchups are. Mm, a reason against playing Bern uh, in near future. I mean, it's and I mean, it's also quite bad. So, Bern, like always, has its good matchups, has its bad matchups. And right now, people like, and there's also a question about the hate. Right now, no one is playing hate against Bern, and everyone are like having their mana bases more painful, more ambitious to just keep up and yeah. play more like. Yep. Like ambitious and cards, so maybe that's a good moment to play Bern, but you know, that's a moment only. And if you are not a Bern player, but you are play, planning uh, to play in in the field that's heavy with Bern, uh, you definitely should consider playing like an extra Sunset Revelry here or an extra Weather the Storm there or whatever. Like, Weather the Storm is probably too extreme, but you know, it's cards like Sunset Revelry is fine, you can play. Uh, I don't even know what Bern hate cards at this point because nobody has been playing Bern for so many years. Like, like you maybe not nobody has been playing Bern, but you didn't need like a dedicated Bern hate card for so many years at this point that I don't even know what's good anymore. Like Revelry is of course good, but like, like you can play Lighting Kilix in for color or whatever. Like, definitely yeah. those are options. Okay, so yeah, Bern is still basic B tier. Uh, Stays the same. Everything I wanted to, I I, I tried to think about something other that stuff. Yeah, this is see, but... this this B for Bern is the peak performance for for this deck. Like we had a moment when Bern was in an A tier. Like I remember once it was a thing. Yep. It it's quickly disappeared. To the but C. Ba- basically, <laughs> Bern is an A minus to C plus deck in this range, and ninety yeah. percent of the time it will be B. Okay. Oh. You you know what won't always be B because for example for me it's a C tier deck. Dredge. Pam 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 pam. Well, I will tell you that recently I've been playing the Merkley deck and I've played against Dredge twice, and I think my matchup is supposed to be like I don't know twenty percent, and I'm a person that really does not believe in eighty twenty matchups. But I do think that like Merkley against Dredge is uh, really bad for Merkley. And I won both times because Dredge is just not a very good deck. And they they were just, you know. Uh, Mulliganing to four all the time. Mulliganing to four, you have one spell pierce, and then you play Merktide, and they can't do anything about it. And then you have another counter spell when it's important. And then post board, uh, you will have a relic from time to time, and they can't win against it. So, like. I feel that Dredge, like. For like you know, it's my pet deck, etc. So like it will be in B because I I had a, like in the in the PTQ I had like eight two result which is you know kind of good and I was playing against like all blue decks and it, for the like first eight rounds I wasn't mulliganing to four at all like I was probably mulliganing to four once and won anyway mm, but like. In the last two rounds, like my deck didn't want to cooperate. I won one of them and the, the lost lost the second one. So like it's still a high variance deck. You can still lose to yourself. Uh, and 
after you realize that you know some games will be lost before the game starts, now you have to ask yourself a question: What other things are in the meta game can be problematic for the edge? And like a week ago, there was a, a, a short moment for Dredge to to play. There was a free copies of Dredge in top thirty two in the like ten round, like four hundred people PTQ, which was a, a strong signal that the deck is like really well positioned. But after that, like also Living Hand got got much more popular. So Gravehead um, is much um, much more played right now. Um, also, uh, like many cards that are really good against Cascade decks, so Fluster Storms, Bell Pierce, and just generally speaking, Cheap Counter Magic uh, is also really good versus versus Dredge, especially when when you need to mulligan that much and you need to mulligan that much. So um, that's why I'm a bit like, a, in, in my opinion, it's not a C C level because. Still, your matchup versus Mutex is really good. Your matchup versus Cascade decks should be good enough. Like, matchup versus Living Hand is good. I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, unless you fail to do anything uh, on the turn 2 and turn 3, and they have enough time to cycle Waker plus like six other creatures to play Living Hand and Board Stall, so you, you won't be able to kill them. Mm, and versus Rhinos, it's a guessing game. If, if they have fun or not, if they don't, you should do your thing. After sideboard, they have also endurance, but that's you know you also have lane nine, so that's this an even fight. Uh, match versus versus full color also looks fine. So in theory, it looks like Dread should be well positioned, but you know like uh, this is not only a position; this is also a a, a position of sideboards and how people are prepared. Sadly, people starting to be prepared versus Dredge, so I would avoid playing it at the moment and wait for this you know, one short window when it can be really good again. So I think that Dredge is either C for cringe or B for bad. And it's more of a, <laughs> it's more of a like, mm, it's, it's similar to the, the Emiria deck that I've said about before, like you can have matchups that are well positioned for you, but your deck is just inherently not great in my opinion. And because of that, you will lose good matchups more often than you'd like. And you will have hard time winning bad matchups more than like other decks. So I'm just not a fan. I'm just not a fan of Dredge right now. And for instance, for instance, matchup versus Amulet is just like, it was all like, always really, really bad because like they had like a faster goldfish you, you couldn't interact with their titan and now we have like urza saga tutoring for grave and endurances so like i'm not even trying to win this match like i'm just like accepting that i will lose this one and like that happens yeah yeah we've all, we all remember sodek's best moments against living uh, against amulet with graveyard decks maybe maybe you, you'll hear it Okay, I think chat uh, ch chat heard it. I don't know if you heard it, but uh, it was a vo uh, voice clip of 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 you uh, congratulating yeah, yeah. your opponent for a very skillful bo use of Bojuka Bok uh, many Bojuka many Bok years ago. Not not fun. Uh, That's for sure. But yeah, okay. Moving on to more things that uh, aren't that fun anymore. I think. Uh, we have uh, Death Shadow. Death Shadow that Sodek has in B, but I I am a hater today, as you can see, and I just have all the decks that Sodek has in B are in C on my tier list, and I just it's basically before we started recording, Sodek said that he kind of has a, a Shadow and B sort of a nostalgia uh, driven pick like. It used to be the best deck in the format just like two months ago or something. Not even two months. Not even a month ago, Lurus was banned. So, like, uh, definitely a deck that was on the very top of the format not that long ago. And right now, like, for me, why do I have Death Shadow in C? Is that I don't see, really see a reason to play Death Shadow over Merc Titan. 
Like that's, for me, there is no true. reason to play Death Shadow over Merc Tide. So, so, so why would you? Why would you? Like one of the things that I hate the most in Magic is playing the deck that's worse version of another deck. And I do think at this point that Death Shadow is a worse version of Merc Tide. So I will just put it in the lower lowest tier I can. And even if it's on power level, it's it's probably more up there with like B tier decks. I just want to emphasize it really, really heavily. Just put it in the lowest tier possible and just try to prevent people from playing it. Because if you do so, like if you play Death Shadow, that means that you have Ragavans. So there is no reason for you if you if you have Ragavans, like, just play Merc Tide. Like just do that and just do it and be happy and win more and yeah Meritate is great yeah your mana base will, it will be better it will win you will lose, lose less often to to random stuff because like you are playing death shadow you need to deal a lot of damages to yourself and then suddenly you know it's easy to lose a control over the game i believe that for instance if there will be a lot of rhinos around uh, and a lot of hammer. I can believe that uh, Shadow can return and can be a, a strong contender. So this is not the the case when you know the deck is okay. Like good good example of the deck. It's not Merfolk, right? It's not oh, oh, obviously. I, I'm 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 trying to find a, a, an example of the deck that uh, got hit but the ban and got completely unplayable, or maybe. Amulet after Summer Bloom ban, like people like forgot about the deck for like two years and they were trying. No, it wasn't that long, definitely. Uh, Maybe uh, I'm I'm thinking about something else. Um, Ad nauseum after Spirit Guide ban from for the most like more okay, recent. So, okay, so, recent so this is this is not this level. The, like no, the no, no, ban, no, 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 like, of course. Like Grixis Shadow is still like. A reasonably powered deck, but like Ian Drake said, just play a better version of it and play Mertite or wait for, for very strange meta with a lot of Rhinos because I believe that Death Shadow will still be really good against Rhinos because th this is one of the few matchups when this card will really make a difference. Oh, and still, right now, still, or in a word, I, I still don't. Mm, don't see why I would ever want to play these card spells at the moment. I just don't feel that they are really well positioned. And mm -hmm. like with so many one one card combos and like for example versus Living End, it is really good, but it's easier to to rebuild uh, from this position. Where and also can... against Living End, you can you you just have so much. Quality hate available in blue red and colorless cards that you don't have to resort to this card. Like you can just play more relics or more spell pierces or magus or anything else that we mentioned. So, cool. and speaking of magus, I think magus is one of the more impactful sideboard cards that you can play in Merktide right now, and you can't really play it in Shadow. I guess you can technically, but it's. But really it's so, hard to do but so. with your plan, because if you want to find the basics, then you, you can't. You only have one basic in your deck, usually, and you, it's you, mountain. So. Yeah, it's you. <laughs> so, like. No. Okay, so. No. so okay. Let's Enough about Shadow. Now we are going to what, at this point, I think is the longest standing deck in the format, in more or less the same shape. Like I think the contender for the like the the longest tenure in modern is without any doubt Tron. I think Tron is basically has is been in the better? format since like 2012, I believe. Like people played a bunch of broken like cloud post decks at the first PT and then it got banned. And then I think like yeah, beginning of 2012, maybe even end of 2011 after the initial wave of bans, I think. Like, Tron basically is the same deck since forever. And it's the only deck that's, that remained intact. Like, it's still uh, one for the mine, two for the tower, three for the plant that generates the power. 
and then we played uh, Karn the Great Cre- or Karn Liberated on turn three. And back in the day, that was all you needed. And nowadays, it might be way too slow. But that's what you do. You do it very consistently. And is it enough to be winning a lot in modern? In our opinion, eh, somewhat. Because we both Kinda. have Tron and B tier. Like, I wanted to point out that Tron uh, got a few good showings. And... For example, in the Mana Traders event, it has a really good conversion. Uh, oh, and we, so... we we can't forget that Tron has like an insanely high win rate against any deck that Sodex is playing because of those free warping whales and free relics. Please don't don't tell me. Like I I strongly believe that like the Tron deck with warping whales and relics, like even like with only one of it, we've we've had a a reasonable matcher versus living and and belcher and dredge yes and any other deck that sodek ever touches and suddenly I'm... like if sodek was playing four color then suddenly warping whale would be insane against four color i don't know how but it would countering expert iteration Boy. it kills dragon <laughs> Easy, two most important cards stopped. Or against Amulet. I I, I think Sodek will find a way for Warping Whale to be against Amulet. <laughs> but I think oh, it's literally a, no targets a, for the first that's mode. Ambitious. Oh, you, you can kill Grazer, okay, sorry. Or Azusa. Okay. Killing Azusa. Um, I mean, or Countering Explore, what? Okay, so about Tron, I'm curious. Like, oh, oh, like we said that like people kind of respected Amulet that they were, they, there were more Magus of the Moon around, but thanks to Card the Great Creator, Tron has some like form of mid game uh, and can um, do this thing more or less. Um, so maybe that wasn't the biggest problem. Yeah. Uh, One still, of the Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, one of the biggest feelbats I remember ever in modern was before MH2, when you still had to play Mana League, and your Tron opponent got to seven on three, and they played Khan the Great Creator with three mana up, and you had your Mana League, and you were looking at this goddamn Khan, and you were like, "What the fuck? Where is my counter spell? Maro, can we get counter spell, please?" And then Maro listened to us. So, okay, hello. One. Okay. Anything else about Tron? I don't think so. I, like Tron was considered as a C tier for a long time. I think the meta game isn't the fastest enough to 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 punish Tron for not having you know removal. Of course, with more burn around, it can. Like, yep. I actually think change. that it's kind of interesting because back in the day, Tron was a deck that was uh, supposed to prey on like fair decks and was kind of bad against linears and i think it almost switched these days i think that tron is playing those cards that you are so scared about like warping whale and relic and if you're playing a linear deck some of those cards are usually good against you but i still don't believe that tron can reasonably go over the top of four color consistently i don't think that happens Uh, i don't think that tron has a good matchup against merktide you are mostly preying on linears instead of playing preying on uh, on those uh, like fair decks, which is not, an interesting uh, no. observation, I think. I don't, I don't have you know the like the exp- experience and knowledge about like how Tron matchups look like because I'm not a Tron player. Uh, what I can say, that, what I like at least in paper, is uh, Sundering Titan in the current switchboard. Uh, it's something that that can extremely punish for color players. Really good. And that's yeah. That's really good. That's that's probably the nice plan that Tron players can yeah. have because like if you try to find uh, to attack their mana like Carn Liberated minus etc. That will be too slow. Instead, it's probably better to just uh, destroy like four lands in a row. I, I, I've there. seen Lori destroying five lands because he had. Yeah, but it was Eldrazi Tronso, you know, yeah. kind of. I guess also, like, destroying lands is obviously really good, unless they have Omnath on board. Because then they can just fetch and make 5 mana and play 
stuff. But yeah, I, yeah, I, I do think that Sean is like not totally embarrassing right now. Like if you like playing Tron, if you got the reps in uh, and you have a good list, I definitely think that Tron is like not a totally terrible choice. Okay. Yeah, but, but uh, don't don't ask us about what list what Tron, Tron list is really good because you yeah, know, the I only have no thing idea. <laughs> uh, just play four mines, four Erza's Tower, four power plant, three relics, and three warping whales, and forty two random cards, and you will win everything. We are paired against Sotek. But yes. speaking of decks that I think are pretty terrible right now. We can go to Yagmov. I don't think Yagmov is good. I think that Yagmov is a deck that struggles a lot against Merktide. The card Merktide Regent is very hard for them to beat. Like their deck is good against Ragavan. I, I will give you that. But even against like uh, other day when I played with uh, with Andreas P P Peterson, we played against Yagmov. We didn't really know we are playing against Yogmov. We were on the play game one. I, we played Ragavan, they played Misty Pass, and I was like, hmm, for color? Okay, so I, will, I guess we'll hold up Spell Pierce for their, uh, for their Renin Six. And we attacked. Then they played like second land, Bez of Paradise. So we bolted it, and then we attack against, uh, again. And then they played like Young Wolf, and we ending it, and we attack again. And at that point, we had like three treasures. And the game was basically unlosable. So, so, like, I do think that's like, I I will stick with with my with my uh, assessment of the matchup. So, or assessment, I guess. Assession, assession doesn't seem like a word, but assessment definitely is one. So, uh, mm. from what I've played against Living End so far, they can't really beat Merktide. Uh, like obviously they can Grist and Minus on Merktide, but if you let Grist stay on the battlefield for for too long, you 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 are probably dead anyways. Uh, and yeah, you have a bunch of good tools to stop their plan from happening. And like Merktide with counter spell is just so good against them, and they are just not playing. Like they have like I don't know ten or fifteen cards in their deck that really matter. Like tutors and yogmovs and yeah, counter spell, really good, yeah. Uh, uh, counter spell, yeah. Like they have like ten or fifteen cards that really matter, and the less, rest of them are like mana, mana dorks and, uh, and limited combo sized too. creatures. And if you play your own limited sized creature, but way way bigger than theirs, like if you play your Merktite and their young wolves and strength loaded guys first of all can't trump it because merkite Mer flies you can't race it because your guys will attack for free at best and you merkite will kill you in two turns uh just not a reasonable thing to do also like it's hard to combo out after getting hit by merkite once because suddenly you have like seven life and you can't go too low i just don't like yakmov right now i also think that um the four color matchup is pretty bad uh, I think that the hammer matchup is like on the play. If hammer is on the play, then it's very dicey. If you are on the play, then it's probably like not bad. Uh, I don't know about uh, living and matchup. I assume you will talk I about mean, it in uh, a like... second. But yeah, overall for me, uh, Yagmov is a C deck right now, and I, I just okay, so... wouldn't recommend playing it. But I, I, I'm v very curious about what you have to say. Like uh, first of all, Yamod versus Hammer. Uh, I like from what I was talking about, uh, like with like Yamod experts. Like I also like saw what Demonic Tutors was talking about the matchups. Uh, is if you are not dead on turn two, then it should be fine because Yamod can dominate the board. So the matchup versus Hammer is kind of good. The matchup versus Living end is also at least reasonable because you have what can sacrifice the, the whole board, so so you return. And you, if you don't draw too many street races and griefs, you won't have enough creatures to to pressure them fast enough, and you need to uh, kill the board with the cascade spells, spells early. Also, Greased can be found because it's, it's an insect for some reason. I don't know what, what this that's super rude. 
the fact that that's... you can't spell Pierce or Force of Negation in Greece, it's so annoying. Yeah, it's it's like I don't know why this uh, wording happened. That maybe because if you mill another Greece, you get another insect token. Yeah, I think it's that's... I I think it's mostly for like, I think it's kind of something they wanted to happen, like that you can't like negate that. Uh, or Maybe. like phone or spell pills. but also like or you I can think, tutor for it, yeah. Yeah, I think what you what they really wanted is like you can tutor for it, you can reanimate it with like a nerve and stuff, and you can collect it company into it. Like, and it's much more elegant than saying, as long as Greece is in your library, graveyard, exiled, or in your hand, it's a creature as well. Like, it just makes yeah. sense to put it this way. Yeah, like I was very, very skeptical about the Avmod 2, but uh, like, why I was skeptical? Two things, four color and rhinos. Rhinos were extremely popular right after the Lurus ban. And this is probably the worst matchup for the Avmod because of the tempo, plus fire eyes, plus fury, plus trample creatures that, that you know, can be champed. So... Mm, this was a really big problem. I was like starting to believe that Yamato will be you know, the biggest loser of this uh, Lurus ban. But after that, like, like this weekend, Yamot won the tournament and got like in the like semi got another play in, in the semifinals. Also, it's in top eight of the mana traders. So it like showed the, the results. Of course, like uh, like I was asking. Yeah, the Diamond players, what actually happened that, that the deck is somewhat playable again. And the question was that like people are not mm, experimenting that hard on four colors, so you won't see that many ephemerate plus fury, for example. Or uh, like the rhinos, maybe not very high, but, but they are already being hated out a bit. So you see, for example, more hammer, or you see more burn, you see more other these type of matchups. So that's why I believe that Yavmod is a fine choice, especially I feel that this is one of the decks that like really rewards uh, an experience in this like uphill battle matchups. And you can, based on like what you can present and how you can sequence your spells, you can, you can actually gain a lot because like these undying creatures can not be v very attractive to kill. So you can pressure the opponent to hold the, their interaction for a bit too long. So these are some some traps you can try to mm, set up. Overall, I'm not extremely high of, on Yavmod. I feel that putting Yavmod on C uh, would be a bit too too harsh for, the, for, the, for it. And B is a fine place uh, for the deck. All right. Uh, so now we are like two hours in, it's a lot of time, what? uh, and we have some more decks to cover, four more decks. So we'll try to go over them a bit faster because there are all C tier decks in both Solex and mine opinions. So why would we just basically talk about why they are bad instead of just talking about it too much. <laughs> so. First of all, we have Affinity, uh, and for me, Affinity is a deck that was supposed that, that was supposed to be really good against like a pile of removal spells from like Lurus decks. Uh, but right now, like Affinity can't really grind against four color. I think I think Affinity is really bad against card Merktide Regent. I think it's terrible against Living End. It's just not it do just doesn't have the right tools to compete in my opinion. Like like man uh, monster prototype was the card that, that was supposed to to be a salvation um, for 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 the archetype. Sadly, this is not the case. Like still, like affinity from time to time can end in top eight. If like I saw this with Stoneforge Mystic as per Sentinel, but it's just, this is not the affinity type of, uh, deck like with uh, Ornithopters, uh, Memnites, etc. It's more like a value oriented blue white deck with Ursa Saga. Like so mid range affinity. Yeah. So it's it, it has foot monitor as an affinity card, but but that's it. So it's really hard for me to 
It's more of a like in the food department decks. Like we've had those mono like blue food decks with uh, with Fot Monitor right after the release of Modern Horizons yeah. 2. And, so and it's more of in, in that ballpark, basically. Yeah, and we like use Ur Urza as a way to generate even more mana to draw even more cards. So this is something like this. Like the only salvation for the deck, in my opinion, is like that how as a saga is my opinion well positioned and maybe that can, can help, but it won't help against Nivikant, for example. It won't help against you know Rhinos or, or Full Color, maybe even because or like amulet. your creatures can can die or you won't be able to like. If you draw Erza Saga plus Drum, sure, you will have a really powerful draw. If you draw just Erza Saga plus a bunch of cheap artifacts, sure, that's good enough. But if you don't draw Saga, the deck is kind of underpowered. Yeah. And also, what I what I basically heard from you is that even with Erza Saga, it won't really help you against the, uh, those S and A tier decks. It will mostly help you against like other B and C tier decks. And yeah. so focusing on not, those is not the best not idea. Not where you want to be. Like, Let's compare like affinity to like burn or something like you know that's or even dredge. Like dredge at least in paper has you know a reasonable matchup versus top tier, and affinity in paper has just bad matchups versus yep. top tier. So just don't play it. This is not a good time to play this. Yep. Like okay. Let's wait for other decks to, to shine. So speaking of decks that are not very good right now, we have Belcher in C tier, <laughs> and Sodek is crying as you can see. Or here, yeah. and yeah, I just don't have anything to say about Belcher really, so I will just okay. So, so let's talk. talk and short note from me, uh, like Possession was the big, really big problem uh, for for the deck, and this was the you know the first hit that got hit, and after the Lurus one, I was thinking like okay maybe Belcher will be better because like the Grixis Shadow won't be around etc. But it turned out that like most like outside Hammer, and even Hammer is playing blue white. Like every top tier deck right now is a blue deck that plays a lot of counter spells or just force of negation or like even like more counter spells post sideboard. So it's hard to goldfish anyone at the moment. Plus, uh, like the hate for the Cascade decks. So for example, Fluster Storm will be also good versus Belcher or Lavinia. Or, or Lavinia. Like or Meddling Mage. All of those cards many, are good against Hammer. Many other oh, cards, or Spell Belgium. Pierce even. Uh, like, this is not the best meta for this. I feel that like if you wait for like one month when Hammer will be more played, when Baron will be more played, like, even for instance, not, not the, best, the best matchup. Like, for example, Four Color will be more represented. Then may maybe Belger can, can shine again. So far, with Living Hand, especially like Living Hand is a terrible matchup. So, like, I don't believe very good? it can be. Very terrible matchup. Very bad, okay. Okay, uh, yeah, that was what I figured out. And I was like, yeah, what the fuck? Why, why would it would be yeah, very good? It can't be. It can't be really good. Okay. So, so like, don't play it at the moment. Not worth. Okay. okay. So, our penultimate deck. I really like this word. Penultimate. Very, ni very nice word. It makes me feel and sound smart. Uh, is, well, another old favorite of many mm. people it's Jund with this uh, unpleasantly looking lady looking uh, maybe not unpleasant look it's like more of a, like a sinister look that she has yes yeah, looking at you thinking whether she should make you discard a card or sacrifice a creature or some other atrocity but yeah Jund in all of Jund's uh, variants. If you want to play Saga, just play Black Green instead of Jant. It's a similar argument that I've already presented with Merc, Titan, Shadow. I think you'd rather play a stronger version of this deck. And if you want to play like a Boomer Jant deck with like Lianas and uh, and Bloodbraid Elves, uh, we didn't really include red black on our list which i think is also a better version of like boomer jump because the important cards like in those decks are like season pyromancer is a strong card and like the, if you are playing like this card dragavan season pyromancer you can play blood moon then in the main deck just play red black instead of jump like basically every version of jump has a counterpart in the format that it's better than this that particular version of jump true 
I'm thinking about the, like this Liliana art, and I like I was thinking what deck I'm looking like. I I'm, I see when I'm thinking about the Liliana and like this black red uh, grief deck maybe can be something better in I like think so. Goals. Like it's a it's a junk style deck that like is unfair enough to compete at least. Yeah, so, maybe not even unfair enough, but capable of like strong, very strong uh, openings. Yeah, openings like. Basically, if your baseline is forces to go into Liliana, you are just not making the cut in 2022. True. And this is, if, if this is your, your best This is your opening. ceiling. This is your best <laughs> yeah. draw. <laughs> so it's really sad. Okay. Okay. Last. And in that case, certainly least, we have blue-white control. And I will say that blue-white is a fucking cringe deck. And I really don't like blue white. And I, like every time I have to play blue white because it's the best blue deck out there. I just feel so terribly because blue white. It's just like if you look at this deck, like it, it even like you are getting new printing so often these days. Like you got an MH two, you got solitude and ending. Um, then you got like uh, you, you got March of the Other World Light. That's very good against Saga. You got. Um, Wandering Emperor, which is also a good card. But the problem with Blue White is that you are playing way too many three and four drops for this format. Like, if you compare it with uh, your Yondex, your four drop is Omnath that generates this mana right back. And you don't have, like, you, don't, you are not playing with any power cards in this deck. Like, for me, in modern, you should play some power cards. And I would, I would say that. The power cards or like power group of cards are like Ragavan with like iteration and Merktite. Not not always like Merktite, but like you should play like red good red cards, or you should play Cascade cards, or you should play Erza Saga, or you should play this like Teferi, uh, Ren, Omnath amalgamation of cards. Like you should play some of those cards. If you are not playing one of those four pillars, like look at our like. SA and most of our B tier. Like most of those decks are playing those cards. And then you have like linear deck like Bern or Tron that or Amulet that don't even Amulet is playing Erza Saga. So. Like even if you are playing linear, but like if these linear decks that are played, like Bern and Tron, they are here only because they like somehow match up well versus what's at the top. It's exactly. not something that's that's that that will last. Like I expect Bern to fall. Again, like three weeks from now, for example. Yep. So, like blue white has uh, like has is it's really good draws. For example, you have um, like early removal into a wall of counter spells with 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 a uh, place walker. But these games won't all won't always be always be the case. Yeah. So, for every game you have this like dream opening. You will also have the game when you just like not have one piece of the puzzle and then the opponent will run out with the game. So yeah. unless you are named Julia Vas <laughs> Guillaume. Yeah. Guillaume. Guillaume to Guillaume. 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 Tak. Guillaume, Guillaume or Guillaume? I think something. Guillaume. Right. Okay, Wafo Tapa. If you are Wafo -tapa. not him, Wafo <laughs> If you are not him. Just uh, yeah, basically, playing like, else, yeah. what Sodex said, the best, like your best case scenario is you have early interaction into Wall of Counter Spells. You can do the same thing with Merktite. And you don't have those, like, okay, my starting hand is a four drop, a five drop, a three drop, and four lands. What do I do? Draws. So, like, just don't play blue white. It's so cringe. Especially, like, now, like, <laughs> These these new versions of Merktite are basically everything that I would like Blue White to be. Like we are still playing those cheap cards. We are still playing efficient uh, removal spells like Heed. You are playing Iteration. You are playing Ragavan because like another Wolf big magic is also here. Yeah, yeah, another big aspect of control decks back in the day I think was that you are blanking your opponent interaction, and that's something that I think is valuable in general. But these days, your interaction is like ending and unholy. Heat. Those are like the two most popular interaction spells in the format. And they can kill your planeswalkers. 
all the same. Like, so why won't you just play Ragavan in your deck then? So you have like a potential to run away with the game. And like from like a competitive standpoint, like I think there's like no reason not to go in this direction, in my opinion. True. Okay. So we are done so with just over two hours uh, on the clock. Well, after I combine it with our like the previous parts and the explanation, it'll be like twelve two Four. hours, fifteen minutes probably. Uh but yeah, a very lengthy video, but there was a lot to talk about and we haven't done one of these in, in a moment. And we even cut the number of decks. We have 17 decks there or 18 and we used to have like 20 or 21. So definitely uh, a good move on our part to, to cut those like decks like creativity that nobody really want to like there are three people on I model believe... playing creativity and having some kind of success and I... good for them, of course. But uh, like we want to want to waste your time on that, I think. Yes, Alec? I actually would like to say that creativity isn't as bad as everyone thinks. Like, it has its moments. And I believe that with the new set, with new triumphs, maybe the new creativity builds will be, will be I can found. See that. Because I, I like the concept of the deck, but I just... Yeah. It, it's like, falls a bit short. It's not... Or, or for example, Mill. Mill after the Lurus ban lost its like biggest strength of yeah. like people having like low mana curves. So yep. some decks are you no know, maybe not dying but are weaker over the time and that's modern, yeah. Yep. So basically I think that triumphs are basically the best shot that creativity has at getting better. Because like what gates creativity is its mana base. And like unless the reprint like original dual lands that are on reserved list in modern like you can't really get any better lands than triumphs that are already in the format so uh yep so that's it uh so if you still manage to stay with us for those two hours and a change thank you so much uh you can find a bunch of useful links in the uh, in the description section uh, so the most important is our Patreon, uh, Model Solutions, which is the main way for us to monetize our content. And if you want to support us, the best way to do so is on Patreon. But even if you just watch this video and click like stuff below, below it, like, like whatever, comment, subscribe, all that jazz, it's still great. Um, also are like Twitch links, uh, Twitter, Twitter profiles. Where, where you can find information about the stuff that we do uh, to follow us with more uh, ease. Yes, Sodek? And if you are not only here to to hear about like the, the metagame position and want to check like a deck guides or side guides, Wonder Solutions is the best place to, to find them. Yep. That's our main product, let's say. Those yeah, that's deck true. and sideboard guides. Yep. That's it. Uh, it's all from us this week. We'll see you maybe next week. I don't know. We'll see. And if not, then happy Easter and have a great time. We'll see you when we see you. Take care and bye-bye. See ya.